program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 153. Be on the lookout for two men working a bunco racket. These men are thought to be borrowing large sums of money on unowned property. That's all. Rose and quest. society as well as the police by working a racket as old as the well-known army game. Theirs was a cleverly worked out plan with every detail rechecked until it looked foolproof. But as in 99 out of 100 cases of this type, they made just enough small mistakes to eventually bring them to our bunker squad's attention. From that time on, theirs was a losing game. Detectives assigned to the case by Captain Canto, commanding the bunco detail, watch them slowly but surely walk right into the trap laid for them. And when the trap was sprung, there were two more criminals who had learned too late the fact that they could defy society just so long and no longer that in the end they could not win. Thank you, Chief Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we take pleasure in presenting as guest artist Miss Esther Ralston, lovely star of many motion pictures who has just completed work on Reunion, 20th Century Fox's latest vehicle with the Dion Quintuplets. In tonight's story, Miss Ralston portrays the part of Cynthia Merrill. Hollywood, the melting pot of the world. Here in the glare of the mighty lights, comedy and tragedy go hand in hand. Men and women from all parts of the globe build dream castles. Watch them cry to their feet. Hollywood and a small bungalow apartment. In the tiny parlor, garrisoned and decorated with pictures of famous movie stars, a man and a woman facing each other. Facing Hollywood. I'm sorry, Jim. I hoped this wouldn't happen, and now it has. So what are we going to do about it? I told you how I feel. You mean I... you won't give it up? You mean that all this tinsel is more important to you than our marriage? Jim, I You're don't... You're trying to tell me that the only thing you want right now is fame as an actress. It isn't just that. It's... Now that I've come so close to getting there, I can't just throw it over. Tomorrow they're testing me at the studio for a part that might make all the difference in the world. If you'd only try to understand how I feel about it, Jim. How about your trying to see the way I feel about it, Finn? What kind of a marriage is this? Living in a two-by-four flat, eating, sleeping, breathing studio talk... You suppose I'm living on a bed of roses? But as soon as I hit, we won't have to live this way. You'll be able to support both of us, eh? And I can become Cynthia Marrow's husband, I suppose. The Queen's husband. No, thanks. It won't work, Cynthia. It can't work that way. 
If you weren't so unreasonable, it could work. I know. I'm the one that's unreasonable. I'm a stubborn, selfish so-and-so, and I can't see beyond the end of my nose. All right. I still say you're going to make up your mind what you want to do. Go on with this idiotic idea of yours, or be my wife and get out of this town where we can settle down as human beings again. Is there more to that, or have you finished? Well, there's a lot more I could say. Uh, it'd only be wasting words. I see. I'm not intelligent enough to understand you. Is that what you mean? You know perfectly well that isn't what I mean. Then why don't you say what you'd like to and get it over with? I imagine I can stand it. You know what you're doing right this minute, Finn. You're just asking for trouble. You're deliberately baiting me because you know I can't stand to hear you talking that way. Nonsense. It isn't nonsense. It's... Oh, all right. I give up. You know when you hit below the belt, don't you? You know just how and when to do it. And you know why you can do it, too, don't you? Because for some reason I can't explain, in spite of everything, I couldn't get along without you. That's what makes me so mad when you start acting with me. That being the case, Jim, why don't you just drop this whole thing and let me see what I can do? I promise you if I don't make the grade, I'll give it all up. No. This is going to be one time that's different. You're going to make up your mind tonight one way or the other. And when you do, it's going to stick. One way or the other. Do you really mean that, Jim? I'm to give up my career or clear out? All right, then. I've made my decision. I'm clearing out, and I'm clearing out right now. Cynthia. Don't Cynthia me. You asked for it. Now you're going to get it. I'm not a child. I can take care of myself. How? I don't know, but don't worry. I can. Hollywood doesn't frighten me. Oh, listen, Sin. Be sensible. You haven't anywhere to go tonight. You can't just walk out into the rain and find a place. No? Well, that's exactly what I'm going to do as soon as I pack this suitcase. Up to this point, I thought you were bluffing with all this talk of yours. But now that I see which way the wind blows, I see a lot of other things. For instance? Well, for instance, the fact that... Oh. What's the use? It would be a waste of words. Thanks. You're welcome. There. You really mean this, then? You bet your sweet life I do. Now, if you don't mind... Would you allow me to get past you and out the door? Of course. Thank you. When you come to your senses, let me know. Um, good night. So, movie struck Cynthia walks out of her house into the drizzling rain, and Jim alone spends the next two hours walking the floor wrestling with his problem. Then, reaches for the phone, dials a number, holds a hurried conversation. And 30 minutes later... Mr. Merrill? Yes. I'm the private detective you sent for. Peter Nato's the name. Oh, how do you do? Now, come on in out of the rain. Thanks. And realize it's raining so hard. Nasty night. Not the pleasantest I've ever known. Sort of unusual weather for California. Yeah, of course. Now, come on in and have a chair, Mr. DiDonato. I'll try to explain the situation in as few words as possible. This isn't a matter for the police by any chance, is it? Police? Oh, no, not at all. It's... Well, to be frank with you, I've just had a quarrel with my wife and she's walked out on me. I don't know where she's gone or who she might be with, anything about her. I'm, I'm going crazy worrying about it. I see. Sort of domestic difficulties? Well, you see, Cynthia, that's my wife. She's nuts on the idea of being a great actress. I think she's got what it takes and all that. You know how it is. Yes, I know how it is, Mr. Marrow. In fact, I'd say roughly that three out of every four cases of domestic trouble I run into are caused by more or less the same thing. It's a chronic Hollywood disease. Well, what I want you to do is to find her for me. You have any idea where she is? No. My simple beginning. Well, go ahead. Well, when you find her, I thought you could sort of keep an eye on her and let me know what she does. Tell me one thing, Mr. Marrow, before we go any further. Is there another man in this? Oh, I don't think so. In fact, I'd stake my bottom dollar there isn't. That at least is unusual. Why, what... I mean, as far as these things go. Oh. Well, it's just the fool movie bug that's responsible for this. And I know if she gets out wandering around, she'll get into some kind of trouble. That's what's driving me crazy. I think I see what you want, all right. A daily report of her activities when and if I can locate her for you, right? Well, I guess that's it. What I want is to hear that you found her and that she's all right. Will you let me know about that part of it as soon as you get news? I certainly will, Mr. Marrow. I don't know just where I'll get wind of her, but if you're giving a picture of her and some details of her recent activities, I think I can manage it. Fine. Anything you want to know, I'll tell you. 
The main idea is find my wife. And so, Private Detective Di Donato and Cynthia's husband discuss the situation far into the night. And Cynthia, wet, cold, her stubbornness fighting a desperate battle with her desire to return home and admit defeat, she spends the night drinking endless cups of coffee and open all-night greasy spoons. And in the morning, the final blow. At the studio, a well-meaning casting director calls her into the office, talks to her. Oh, in order to save you a lot of time, I've decided to be frank with you, Cynthia. I haven't got a chance in the world. Oh, swell kid and all that, but well, it takes more than that to make the grade in this business. I think I get it. You mean I can't act? Well, if that's the way you want to say it. Oh, listen, kid, don't take it so hard. There's lots of other ways to make a living. It's a pretty tough racket, especially for a girl. If I were you, I'd... Well, I'd just forget pictures and get interested in something else. Sure, just like that. Well, thanks for giving it to me straight anyway. I appreciate it. Only, it's kind of a jolt at this particular moment. Don't worry, I'll get along all right. Sure you will. You, you've got what it takes, kid. For anything but pictures. I know. Goodbye, Mr. Elliot. For further details, read your morning papers. So Cynthia finds herself with a choice of two things. Admit defeat and go home to Jim, or take the first job she can land doing anything. And after a day spent in answering what ads, trudging from this place to that and back again, her luck takes a sudden turn for the better. Takes her to a house on Crest Hill Road, where she lands a job as personal secretary with two attorneys. One stipulation of the job gives her a moment of panic when she learns that she's to live in a small house adjoining that of her employers. But the thought of Jim gloating over his victory if she goes home supplies the needed courage. And so, nervous but determined, Cynthia Marrow accepts the job, moves in. A week goes by, a week in which Cynthia discovers some strange things about her new position. There seems to be nothing for her to do. No letters to write. No phone calls to answer. None of the things she was hired to do. And a sudden uneasiness grows within her. Then one night, as she is talking to her employers, the answer is revealed. I have a little job you can do for me tomorrow, Miss Merrill. It's vitally important to me. Yes, Mr. French? I want you to go downtown with me to a loan company. Yes. And I want you to be a Mrs. Crandall. Mrs. Crandall? Right, Mrs. Crandall. But I don't see quite what... It isn't necessary that you see anything. The important point is that you are a Mrs. Sarah Crandall, that you own the property at 2128 Crest Hill Road, and that you sold it to a party by the name of Victor French about two months ago. Victor French? Well, that's your name. Exactly. But, Mr. French, I can't do that. It would be breaking the law. That is our business, Miss Merrill, not yours. But, Mr. Denton, it is my business. I was hired as a secretary. You were hired to do what we wanted you to do. Mr. French has just told you what that is. Well, I won't do it. I thought there was something funny about this whole thing. Now I see what it is. And now that you see, you'll do exactly as we say. Oh, no, I won't. I'm not going to let you drag me into a mess. You're going to do exactly as we say. But I might... Well, tell you, Miss Merrow, that Mr. French and I are not in the habit of speaking lightly. I cannot impress upon your mind too strongly the fact that you will do as we instruct. And you will not say anything to anyone about it. Do I make myself clear? And if I don't do as you say, Mr. Denton? Then I am afraid you will be sorry. Intensely sorry. So Cynthia returns to her fear clutching her, her mind whirling with the realization that she has walked into a spider's web, that her employers are not attorneys but criminals capable of doing anything. And it is while she is sitting on the edge of her bed, thinking desperately, on the verge of tears from sheer fright, that a sudden noise at the outside door turns her heart to ice. Detective, but... Please, Mrs. Merrow, don't waste any time. 
All right, just a second. What do you want? Come out here where we can talk. I'll explain in a minute. But I don't see what... Mrs. Marrow, if your friends in the house see us talking here, there'll be trouble. Now, please don't ask questions until we get up the street a ways. I'll explain everything then. All right, I'll come. Go up here, out of the light. How did you know my name was Mrs. Merrill? I've been watching for you a week. I heard every word those men said tonight. Now, will you believe me when I say that I'm here to help you? I'd like to. All right. We can talk here without being seen. Now, look, Mrs. Merrill, I know you're in a jam, and I know that you're going to be in a worse one unless we act. Will you do just as I say and not ask any questions? But I don't understand what you're doing here. Why are you watching me? That's unimportant at the moment. Will you do as I ask? Yes. Good. Now, tomorrow, you go with those men and do exactly what they say to do. Don't cross them up in any way. But I don't... Please. After you've done all that, figure out when you can get away from here for an hour or so. You can do that, can't you? I think so. Good. Now, when you've figured it out, call me at this number. I'll meet you, take you to my office, so we can make plans. Now, will you do that? I'll try. But I can't understand all this. Where you came from and why you're watching me. I'll tell you all that when I see you at my office. But now we've got to be careful, very careful. All right. I'll do my best. I don't know who you are, but thank you. Well, that's all right. I have a good reason for it. And don't lose that telephone number. I'll be waiting for a call. The following day, Cynthia Company's friends to the loan company. Follows his instructions to the word. Returns to the house on Crest Hill Road. She has no opportunity to call Vigonato that night. But the following morning, she tells French she has some shopping to do. Secures permission to go downtown for the morning. A hurried phone call brings the private detective in his car, and a few minutes later, they enter his office. Mrs. Merrill, this is uh, Mr. Molinay and Mr. Ryan. They work with me. How do you do? How do you do? How are you? Sit down. Thank you. Now, I want you to repeat exactly what Mr. French told you the other night, and also what you did yesterday at that loan company. Well, Mr. French told me that I was to say I was a Mrs. Crandall, and I told him I wouldn't. Then Mr. Denton told me I'd have to... And when I repeated that I wouldn't, he threatened me. In what way, ma'am? Well, he didn't say what he'd do if I didn't. But it was the look on his face and the implication that made me realize what I'd gotten mixed up in. I suppose you tell us just what it is that they're doing. Well, I'm not sure myself. But yesterday at the loan company, I had to sign a deed of some kind saying that I had sold the property on Hillcrest to Mr. French. That is, that I, as Mrs. Crandall, had. And Mr. French and the man there talked about a loan. And from what I gathered, Mr. French and Mr. Denton are borrowing on the property they're living on. And you don't think they own it? No, I'm sure they don't. Yeah, it's all pretty clear what they're up to, eh, Mullinay? That's that way. Mrs. Murrow, we're here to help you. We're going to. You've got to help us. But how? We're going ahead with this idea. Doing everything these men want you to. But I'm afraid. Supposing the police get onto this and arrest me, what do I do then? You don't have to worry about that, ma'am. You see, we are the police. What? I thought you said you were a private detective. I am, Mrs. Manor, but these gentlemen are Lieutenants Mullinay and Ryan of the Los Angeles Police Bunko Squad. Then you already knew about this? Well, Mr. DiDonato called us in after he talked to you the other night, Mrs. Manor. See, we've known each other for some time, and when he saw that this was a criminal case, he turned it over to us. But, oh, I don't understand this whole thing anyway. No one has told me anything except what to do. I guess it's my turn now, Mrs. Manor. You see, I was hired to keep an eye on you, sort of see that you didn't get into trouble. Jim hired you. Well, I'm not at liberty to answer that, but the idea is that I was watching you from the time you left the studio to the time I talked to you the other night. And you've been spying on me, is that it? Oh, I wouldn't be too hasty about this, ma'am. What would you be if Mr. DiDonato hadn't been watching you, hadn't been there to help you out? What would you have done then? I'm sorry, I didn't think. It was just the idea of being spied on that made me lose my temper. That's all right, ma'am. I'm used to that. And, and you want me to go back to that house and pretend to fall in with their plans? Is that right? Exactly. All right, I'll do it. But there's one thing I'm going to ask. Yes? That no one, and that includes my husband, knows of this. There'll be no publicity as far as we're concerned. And then I'll do it. Splendid. We appreciate your cooperation, Mrs. Merrill. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to help, only... Only what, ma'am? Only I can tell you this. I'm going to be scared to death every minute from now on. Cynthia Merrill returns to the Crest Hill house, her mind whirling. And Lieutenants Molinay and Ryan lose no time setting the wheels of the law into motion. They assign two men to stake the Crest Hill house, spend the rest of the day and all night poring over musty files in the records bureau, make plans for a foolproof trap. 
And by morning, they are in possession of the following facts. Past records show both French and Denton to have been arrested before on forgery and attempted extortion. The deed of sale on the Crest Hill property has already been forged by Denton. Evidently, the loan company needed only the substantiation of Mrs. Crandall, the past owner, to complete the transaction. A checkup with the loan company reveals the fact that it will be a matter of three days to a week before the final approval can be secured and the check issued. And acting upon this, Lieutenants Molinay and Ryan interview a bewildered official at the loan company's offices. Give instruction. But, uh, but, Lieutenant, if, if, uh... These men are swindlers. Why, why do you want us to give them the check? I don't understand. Because if you go right ahead, just we're all in the up and up, and don't scare them off. The minute you hand over the check, we'll knock them over. <laughs> but uh, supposing something goes wrong and they get the check, but you miss them. We are not in the habit of missing people we want. Oh, really? Well, oh, I guess. Well, it uh, strikes me as risky business, uh, hand, handing out good money to crooks. Now, I, look, uh, look. Is there any way that the signature on the check might be just wrong enough to keep them from cashing it? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, well, isn't that a clever thought? Yeah. It, it could be done, then. Oh, certainly. E easiest thing in the world. Well, that's the answer to your worry. As soon as the check is ready, let us know. Then notify French and Denton of the fact. When they come to get it, we'll do the rest. Returning to headquarters, Molinay and Ryan lay their plans before Captain Canto, head of the Bunko Squad. Secure five men to assist them. Two are sent to the Crest Hill house with orders to watch French and Denton day and night and report every move. The other three are staked out in front of the loan company building. Then, with final plans made, Molinay and Ryan settle down to await developments. Two days pass. Nothing happens. Three days. Four days. And then on the morning of the 5th, a hurried phone call from one of the detectives at the Crest Hill house. I think something's up, Lieutenant. There's another fellow around here, a young kid with a car. Looks as though they were getting ready to go somewhere. Good. Don't lose sight of them for a second. Call me back at either this number or the one I'll give you now if anything breaks. Okay. Write this down. The stakeout in the drugstore across from the loan company, Normandy 5270. Normandy 5270. Got it. Well, don't lose it. Don't worry, I won't. In company with his partner, Ryan Molinay, loses no time in making final arrangements. Then the two of them proceed to the drugstore, where they plan to watch for the suspect's arrival. Well, unless I miss my guess, things ought to start happening before long. I hope you're right. I hate to have anything go here at this point. I'll get it. Okay. Hello? Ryan? Yeah? French and the girl have just left the house. They got a car and some kid driving. Good. How about that? He's still at the house. Mm, that's not so good. Wonder what the idea is, leaving him behind. You can't tell. I'll call you if you leave. All right. Goodbye. Well, what's up? French and the girl are on the way down. They left Denton at the house. Something screwy. That's queer. I figured they'd try to get the check cash and then beat it out of town. This Denton angle doesn't fit that idea. Hold everything. Right. Hello? Ryan? Yeah? This has got to be fast. Denton's getting ready to leave. He's waiting on the corner here for a bus. I'll hop it with him and call you first chance I get. Okay, don't lose it. Don't worry. I'll stay here till you call back. Do it as soon as you can. Okay. Denton's waiting for a bus. Guess he's coming down here, too. It's funny they're splitting up. Jim's going to ride the bus with him and call me here as soon as he can. Good. I'll fix your locating. Then come up to the office. I'm going up there now. Hey, what if French and the girl get here without death? We'll have to figure that out when it happens. I'll check up with the boys on the way up. I'm going to stick around close. Okay. See you later, and good luck. Same to you. Ryan at the drugstore stakeout, Molinay crosses the street, gives whispered last-minute instructions to the three men loitering at the entrance to the building, enters the offices of the loan company, where he is met by a highly nervous official. Assuring him that nothing can slip, he hides in a little booth from where he can see the official but cannot be seen himself. The minutes tick slowly on, and then suddenly, Lieutenant Ryan hurries through the door, approaches him. Something's up. Ray just called me and then down to the recorder's office. Looks as though he was waiting for someone. Oh, what the devil. Hey, wait. I got it. Look, Ryan. You stick here with me. When I knock French over, you take the check and beat it downstairs. Get it sent over to Denton at the recorder's office by special messenger. That's the idea. I'll explain later. As soon as you sent the check, get over there fast and watch what happens. You see him take the check, pick him up. You get it? Yeah, I think I do. Good. Come on in this booth here. French and the girl ought to be here any minute. Okay. Flatten against the wall there. Yeah. This way we can see them, but they can't see us. Yeah, we hope. Right. Hey, wouldn't we feel silly if they'd got 
smart and wise and left us flat-footed? <laughs> hey, you don't suppose anything like that could happen, do you? It could, but I have hopes that it isn't. Well, time will tell. Wait a minute. Quiet. <clears throat> um, good morning, Mr. French, Mrs. Sandler. Good morning. I understand my check is ready. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, that's, that's right. Quite, quite right. I have it right here. Uh, good. If you'll be so kind as to hand it to Mrs. Crandall. Uh, oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, of course, Mr. French. He's making the girl take it. Not so good. He's a smart lad. Here you are. Fifteen hundred dollars. Thank you. All right. I'll take it now, Mrs. Crandall. Here you are. Let's go. Just a minute, Mr. French. What? Say, say, what is this? You might call it an arrest. Come on, put out your hands. What, what, what does this That's mean? That's what it looks like, French. The end of the line. Oh, just take that check. Thanks. Yeah, Ryan. Get this over to our friend Denton as fast as you can. I'll keep Mr. French and the lady company until you get back. Leaving Molinet and his prisoners at the office, Ryan carries out instructions. And ten minutes later, he watches Denton pocket the check. Let's him walk out of the recorder's office into the street, then promptly places him under arrest. Returning to the loan company with Denton handcuffed to him, he rejoins Molinet. So here we are, all together. A pretty smart idea of yours, Denton, waiting to record this transaction till after you got the check. That way, if anything went wrong, you wouldn't have a forgery rap at the recorder's office. Luckwise, guy, I'd like to know one thing. How the devil did you get on to us? Well, I'll let you in on it, but for one thing, French. You're going to have such a long time up there with nothing to do that I'd hate to deprive you of the pleasure of figuring it all out for yourself. You're a pretty smart fella. It'll be a very simple matter for you. Come on, let's go. French was found guilty of grand theft and conspiracy against the loan company. And on May 12, 1932, he was sentenced to one year on the county road gang, five years probation, and fined $500. On December 9th of the same year, his probation was modified, and he was released. Denton was found guilty of forgery and conspiracy. And on May 6, 1932, Judge Barnett of the Superior Court of Los Angeles sentenced him to San Quentin Penitentiary to serve a term of from one to 14 years. The girl was held as a witness during the trial and later released. Thank you, Chief Davis. If you could make tests of your gasoline as city and county purchasing departments do, you would never again be satisfied with anything less than the police car performance of Rio Grande cracked gasoline. You could not be induced to buy slow-burning, sluggish brands. You would use the same gasoline that Los Angeles, Oakland, Alameda, Fresno, Santa Barbara, San Diego, Maricopa County, Arizona, and many, many other cities and counties have used in their police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment. Rio Grande cracked gasoline with tetraethyl. And you would use Sinclair motor oils, too. These completely de-waxed, de-jellied, longer-lasting motor oils are produced by the same nationwide organization that originated the famous patented cracking process, which makes Rio Grande cracked the best gasoline you can buy. Get your copy of Calling All Cars News from your independent Rio Grande dealer. Learn how you can help some boy or girl become a junior detective with free gifts of police badges, fingerprint outfits, handcuffs, sirens, and other valuable items. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, speaking for the Rio Grande Oil Company.